already started here. Yeah, no, that was the review. Okay, good morning, everyone. Today is Friday, March 16th to 29th of Adar. And today's daf will be Avodah Zarah daf Samach. Uh, and we will start from the third to last line of Nun Tet Abed. We're continuing along with some of these sort of short sugyot with some kind of a case that presented itself to the Amoraim, and then they gave their psak, and then some of the details get worked out along the way. So the Gemara says, vita de chamra de ishtakil le barza. There was a barrel. I'll be, hopefully, you can draw this kind of now. The problem is, what kind of barrel are we talking about? Let's assume, for simplicity's sake, it's just something like this. But, and it has a spout partially, partially here, right? Okay. Didn't have fancy spouts like this back then, but something like this. So now what happens? The, the spout gets taken out. Now you just have a hole. What happens when you have a hole in a barrel? The wine starts coming out, okay? So a guy comes over, and he's going to put his hands over the over the thing to keep the wine coming out, okay? Nanju. Nanju. Ha'hi chavite d'chamer di ishtakil barza ata ovid kuchadim aidre anach yadei iloi. So... The spout fell out, so the non-Jewish person comes over and puts his hand over the hole to keep the wine from spilling out. Amar of Papa, called it Lahave Barza, so everything that was sort of touching the spout, somewhere in the proximity of the spout area, whether it's you know the wine that's here, whether it's the wine that already came out, okay, Asir, uh, that wine is prohibited because it came the non-Jewish person touched it. The idach shari and the rest of the wine in the whole barrel is permissible. Okay, the ikad de amre, a second version of Rav Papa, Amar Rav Papa, ad habarza chamra asir. All of the wine in the top half of the barrel is prohibited because it would have drained out of the hole. So the fact that it remains in the barrel because this person holding their hand against the spout is what keeps it in, so that's prohibited. The idach shari and the part in the bottom half is permissible. Okay, so one is obviously much more machmir than the other. The first version of Rav Papa basically says only the wine in direct proximity to the opening is what's prohibited. But the second version of Rav Papa says anything that would have been uh, drained out of the barrel. Okay, so Amar Rav Yemar Ketanai. Maybe this position of Rav Papa is associated with the Machlok Ketanaim, and in fact, Rav Papa's position is that of the minority position. As Rashi explains, um, the second to, second line of Rashi on Sama um, uh, that that the uh, Hadimuki Rav Yemar Milte de Rav Papa Ketanai the Kamle Rav Papa Kirav Yehuda de Yichidah. So the Yichid Rabim Halachak Rabim that actually Rav Papa's position, the case that we just discussed, is actually going to be associated with the position of Rav Yehuda, and therefore Rav Yemar is challenging Rav Papa by saying, "Oh, it's Ketanai." And your position is like actually the minority position. So let's see what he says. It's like this case from Masachet Tevul Yom. Ketanai, the Mishnah in Tevul Yom says, Chavit Shenikva, a barrel that was pierced, that a hole, the hole. Now again, these barrels, Rashi points out as well. Here we're talking about a clay or um, a pottery type of uh, vessels. We're not talking about a wooden barrel like was common already in Rashi's time. Um, okay, so Chavit Shenikva. If it was pierced in the at the at the mouth at the opening of the barrel or on the shuleha on the underside of the barrel, or in the side, benagabo tivulyom tima'a, and tivulyom someone who is still tame uh, that is someone who has uh, gone to the mikvah but uh, still has to wait until sunset so it's considered to be sheni uh, latuma so if he touches the wine. So we have to be talking about truma wine in order for this to be a problem. Okay, Rabbi Yehuda Omer Mipiha Umishuleha Tamea. If it's from the mouth of the barrel or from the underside, it will be prohibited. So what the case we're talking about here, right? We're comparing what did it was the hole at the top, at the bottom, or on the side. Okay? So Rabbi Yehuda says, Mipiha Umishuleha Tamea, Umitsideha Tehora, Mikan Umikan. If it, you, the hole that it could drain out of is in the top or in the bottom, 
then that's going to make the wine in the whole barrel tamay. But if it was on the side, it's not. So let's look at what Rashi says. So Rashi says, um, uh, yeah, it's the one, Nikivami Piha, Hoil the whole Hayain Shilamatana se basis le Elyon. Have a Hibur, Mishulehanami, who have a whole Hayain in Shachar Nekeb, a Hibur, and Val Nekeb, Mitsideha, Tehoramikan Mika. So the point of Rabbi Yehuda's position, if the hole is at the top, well, then whatever you touch here, right, the wine that he actually contacts is only up here. But the rest of this is a basis, it supports the wine. It's what made it possible for him to touch this wine. So that also is, becomes associated, at least for the laws of Tuma, that if it's a basis, it becomes the support. The lower wine supports the wine on the top layer. Obviously, if you touch the wine at the bottom, it's because all of the wine will be able to drain out of the hole. And then if you touch on the side, neither of those two really apply. Okay? Mm -hmm. Or at least you would say only mikan and mikan, like that the amount above will be tame, but everything underneath will be tame. That's okay. really strange. It's a bit strange that he says from top and bottom are both problematic and the side is less so. Yeah. The yeah. side is like you create a line along the chavit. We're going to see. It seems like it just means like a hole in the side. Like someone, you know, drilled a hole into the into the pot, into the earthenware. Uh, part of the thing here is some of these were made with, I would think all of these were made with fired pottery. Um, but the pottery was often relatively thin so that you'd be able to puncture it to get the wine out or whatever. Mm. A lot of the malachot of Shabbat that we have about, you know, soda cans and, and tuna cans and things like that go back to these kinds of questions of containers that were made in such a way that, you know, the neck of the wine barrel would be very narrow and you would kind of chop it off or slice it off in order to be able to get the, the wine out or things like that or figs or, or who knows what. Okay, so I'm a Rav Papa. Rav Papa says, Ovi kochavim adana. Now a new case. So in other words, we sort of seem to have resolved this this case. Rav Papa had given his ruling, and Rav Yemar says, oh, it's Ketanai, it's like this opinion of Rabbi Yehuda in a case about Tuma. So this is an interesting association. We've connected the laws of, of Yainesech with the laws of Tuma. That is the kind of contact that a person would have to have in order to disqualify something because of Tuma in the Tanaitic uh, period is now being associated by an Amora to a case of Yainesech. So it's an interesting association. Okay. Another case of Rav Papa. We'll see Rav Papa and his family feature rather prominently on oh. today's da. Yes. Back in the Truma thing. Um, so this is only going to apply, this is only going to apply to Truma. Meister Shani, it wouldn't apply because... But Meister Shani, we only go up to Shani. Up to Shani, yeah. Right, so it won't be a problem. So for, and Kod it could be Kodesh wine or something like that, but much less common. Why Kodesh, I believe, if you need it for the Beis Amikdash, for Nesachim or something. Oh, yeah, right. Um, much less common. Okay, Amarav Papa. Ole kochavim adana of Israel akuba. What happens if the non-Jewish person is pouring, you go to the wine store, and the way they had wine wholesalers back then was you would have, I can keep my same barrel here. So they would have, you would, you would pour out the wine from the thing, and then you would have a smaller... You can be very artsy here. They would have one of these, okay? And you would pour the wine into here. So the person buying the wine is gonna hold the flask like this, and the person pouring the wine is tilting the big barrel, okay? So this is the dana, and this is the kuba, okay? If the idol worshiper of the non-Jew is, is tilting the big barrel, the Yisrael akuba, and the Yisrael, is holding the smaller flask, chamra asir, the wine is prohibited. My time, aki ka'ati mikoach ove kochavim, ka'ati. The wine is being poured because of the strength, because of the force of the non-Jew. The non-Jewish person is, is in control of the flow of the wine because he's tilting the barrel. Israel adana, and if in the case that the Jewish person is tilting the large barrel, the ove kochavim akuba, and the ove kochavim is holding the flask stationary, Chamra Shari, the wine will be permissible. But ve'i mitzadei tzadude, if he uh, tilts it around, asir, it will be prohibited. Why? Uh, the point is that if you're just holding it stationary, you're not actually doing anything. There's no action that the non-Jew is taking. So holding the kuba uh, is, is not problematic. Um, and as Rashi says, kuba achatas, no, that's going to come up later. Uh, sorry. Um, 
Yeah. Fine. Okay. Um, okay. So that's the next case. That is, in other words, just holding stationary is not going to be a problem. Okay. Even said it's a duty as there. Amar of Papa, or of Papa, Hayo Vikochavim did Dari Zika Vikazil Israel Achore. What about a case of a non-Jewish person is transporting wine in a wine skin in a in a bag, and the Jewish person is following after them? So in the case that is to make sure that they don't uh, do any uh, nefarious, uh, idolatrous things with the wine. Okay. So Malia, if it's full of wine, Shari. So if it was full, it's permissible because you can't shake it around. There's no air bubble, so there's no shaking. So it doesn't, there, you can't do anything to it. But if it's uh, partially empty, then you could shake it around, and that's what makes it prohibited. Okay? Oh, okay. Kuba um, Malia Asir. But if it's an open amphora, an open jar like this, it's prohibited, even if it's uh, full. Dilma naga, because maybe he would have touched it, because the wine reaches near the top of the flask. Chasera, but if it's only partially full, shari dilonaga, it becomes permissible because it's partially empty and couldn't reach. So that is, if you have wine in a, in a now I can't, I can't draw a difference between a, a jar here. This is a jar. Okay, and this is this is a, a bag, right? So if here it's only full partially, then this is a sewer. And here, if it's only full partially, this is this will be Muzar. Okay, because here he can't touch it, and here he could shake it around, right? So those are the differences. Okay. Okay. Fine. What about Ravashi Amar? Ravashi disagrees with Rapapa and says. Zika, a uh, wine skin, if it's in a bag, it's not in a jar. Malia, a bain, bain malia, o bain chasera shari. If it's full or empty, it's permissible. My time, ein derech nisuch bechach. That's not the way people perform idolatrous worship to use wine that's being transported in a wine skin in a bag. The notion that the wine would be carried in a skin, I think, is generally uh, lesser, uh, less preservation of the quality of the wine, and it's less. It's less kavod in some way. Uh, it's sort of a cheaper implement. So there is a se sense that it's not going to be uh, done in, the, in an appropriate way, or that's not the way that they normally worship their idols or something like that to use it from, from a bag. It's like miso from a beer can. It's right, something like that. It's like it clearly more of a disposable uh, container. Um, okay. So in the previous yeah. case, are we concerned that the non-Jew, if he was pouring the wine for the Jew, that well, in that process he was making some kind of an idolatrous. Uh, I don't uh, think necessarily. Ritual. I think we're concerned that that's the Durabanan rules of Stamienam, that he's having enough contact and enough control over the wine, the flow of the wine, where it is. It's like he's touching it enough that it's a problem, right? Just like shaking the barrel, uh, shaking the bottle is a problem. So here, tilting the barrel and pouring it out is also a problem. Even if he's not, even if you could be hundred percent sure he has, doesn't have any. Uh, religious intent. So then what, what did we say the problem was if we're sure it's not religious? The, the contact with the non-Jew and wine and socialization yeah. and all this Yeah, stuff? things like that. I mean, that may have been the motivation behind making the law, but at the end of the day, they made a law that non-Jews handling wine and that was, isn't allowed. Okay. Uh, right. Okay. Um, okay. So uh, what are we talking about? So as to talk about the wine press, in the wine press. So Rav Papi Shari, Rav Papi allows it. Rav Ashi, the Itema Rav Shimi Bar Ashi Asr. And uh, Rav Shimi Bar Ashi says it's not allowed. So what are we really talking about? The Gemara is not so clear. Okay, so if you look at Rashi, Me'atzara Zaira, Gat She'ein De'in Dorchin Ela Kopshim Bakora. It's a wine press where they don't press the grapes with their feet, but they use a mechanical press, okay? So we put the grapes into this thing. We have a piston type device and there's there's a beam and you push up here. This pushes down, crushes the grapes and the wine flows out. Okay? That's what we're talking about. That is, if the non-Jew is operating the press in a way in which they don't actually have any contact with the grapes directly, right? We already talked about 
if the non-Jewish person is actually touching the grapes with their feet or with their hands or whatever. Uh, but what about here? We're talking about in a case where there was no physical contact with the grapes and the wine themselves. Okay. So Rav Papi, uh, or maybe it's Rav Papa, it's a little bit unclear, um, uh, says that it's permissible. And Rav Ashi, or perhaps Rav Shimi Bar Ashi, says it's not permissible. So Bekocho, if it was being done by his own action, by his strength, okay? Everyone will agree that it is prohibited because if the non-Jewish person is the one whose control has the force, has the power over the wine, then that would be what's prohibited. That's like tilting the barrel. Okay? But the debate is what about a secondary uh, degree of, of control or power? And look at Rashi. So if you actually just press, I take my arm and I press the lever and it crushes the grapes, that's koho. That's my strength is controlling the wine press. And that's going to be a problem. But if I put rocks into the thing and, and the rocks weigh it down, and that's what does it. So if that's not koho, it's not koho, then that's koach koho. The action is being affected by a secondary action undertaken by the non-Jewish person. And the debate of these Amoraim is about koach koho. Do we, are we concerned about a secondary degree of control? Okay. But there's a second version of how to treat this debate that we actually could say, no, really, everyone agrees that koach koho is permissible. La pligi de shari. Ki pligi koho. And actually, the debate between Rav Pepe and Rav Ashi is about Koho directly, meaning even if, if there's no contact at all, and it's just a matter of your force creating the wine, even there, maybe that's actually even the debate. And Koach Koho, two degrees removed, I'm putting the rocks into the basket to weigh down the wine press. That's going to be, um, everyone would agree that that's permissible. Okay. So have a uvda be Koach Koho. The case... A, a case presented itself that was a case of koach kocho, secondary degree, the asar Rav Yaakov min Nahar Pakod. And Rav Yaakov from Nahar Pakod said it was prohibited, which seemingly uh, fits the uh, first version and uh, fits the position of Rav Ashi within the first version. Uh, we use that as my sarav, a, a real case, to try to sort of prove that actually Rav Ashi's position as treated in the first case was the was the Allah. Yeah. This would have an application today where we use automated means of crushing grapes. Certainly. If there's a mechanical press which is powered by hydraulics or powered by an electric uh, motor or something yeah. like that, it may not even be koach koho. Meaning, and again, this has implications both ways. If we want to say that, you know, like I was talking about the other day, Welch's grape juice or whatever, if every, yeah. let's assume everything is totally automated. The grapes come in on a conveyor belt, dry, and they get dumped into a machine and they're crushed by a robot and they get bottled. Okay? So if all of that process is fully automated, mm -hmm. you have a hard time saying it's prohibited. If there is a step where someone is pressing a button or turning some lever or something like that, you get into koach koho questions. Um, and is there something else I was going to say about that? Oh, but the opposite problem, Pesach is coming. We have to talk about machine matzahs or machine-made tzitzis or any other kind of mitzvah item which needs to be done Lishma needs to be done with kavana, needs to be done with shame mitzvah, things like that. So can that be done by an operate, uh, uh, automated process? The question of machine matzahs in particular, when the matzah baking machines came out in the 19th century, was a major debate. Uh, can, can you use such matzahs for the mitzvah of matzah? Uh, do they have the necessary human intent or not? Is pressing a button that starts a run that makes 10,000 matzahs uh, good enough? Um, so, so there's where a leniency in one place could bring a stringency in Certainly, one certainly. On which way you rule. It always happens like that. Okay, you just have to know enough cases to know which case is which. Yeah. Okay, so right at the bottom of Samach Hamud Aleph, Hahu Chavita de Ifka A Le Orka. A case of a wine barrel that split lengthwise. So lengthwise means, use the same barrel, split lengthwise, it got a crack running down lengthwise. Okay, so the ifka ale orka, idre hahu ve kochavim chavka. The non-Jew saw the wine is going to spill out. He he got he wanted to be a good Samaritan, quite literally. Um, 
And he jumps up and he hugs the wine barrel to keep it closed so the wine doesn't spill out. So, Shari'e Rafram Bar Papa. Rafram Bar Papa said, in such a case, the wine is permissible. Okay, but a different version is that maybe it wasn't Rafram Bar Papa and he was Shari'e, he allowed them to drink it, but maybe it was Ravuna, the son of Rav Yehoshua, and he allowed them only to sell it to non Jews. We've seen this distinction for the past few days, that there may be some cases where it's permissible to sell it, but not permissible to drink it yourself. Um, and we're going to see, actually, uh, in the next Mishnah, the position of Rabbi Shimon. Uh, Rabbi Shimon gets praised for not having this intermediate category uh, because it seems a little bit ambiguous. Well, is it Yenesek or not? Like, just tell me. Uh, but that also feeds into, like I had mentioned the other day, the uh, debate in the Rishonim, about maybe stam yenam that's only drabanan, or at least certain types of stam yenam that are only asurmi drabanan are only permissible to drink and not to derive benefit from. Um, but that's an extensive debate. Oh, behane mile de fakala orka. This is only in a case where it was split lengthwise. Aval le futier, but if it was split horizontally, uh, equatorially around the barrel. Okay. Afilu bishtiashari. And even Rav Huna, the son of Rav Yehoshua, will allow you to drink the wine. My time, huh? Why is the reason? Your, the non-Jew is doing the work of a brick. That is what? Here, to provide the pressure to close the crack, the, the uh, long, latitud latitudinal crack, uh, longitudinal crack, sorry. Um, the non-Jew has to be applying force from both sides, okay? to close the crack. So he's really doing something, keeping it from pouring out of the crack. If it's split horizontally, and he just presses down, well, he's doing ma'asele veina. He's doing the same work that could be done by putting a brick on top. That is, you're not doing anything. You're, you're just applying pressure. Applying pressure doesn't count as touching the wine. But here, sort of holding the whole barrel closed, it's maybe an artificial distinction, but the difference between a vertical pressure, which could be done by an inanimate object, and this horizontal pressure, which would be harder to set up a circumstance where it would be done, especially in the ancient world, to do something uh, uh, horizontally requires sort of the human action of holding it from both sides. Chabka, he, he was hugging it. Okay. They found an Anju in the wine press. If it was wet enough to be able to wet something else, that's a common uh, measure of moisture uh, in halacha. It's wet enough that if you touch something else, it makes it wet. So by hadacha ubai nigu, it has to be washed out and it has to then be dried out afterward. The la, and if it wasn't that wet, it was only a little bit wet. Behadacha be'alma sagila. It's good enough to just wash it out without having to dry it out. Why? Because what's the problem? You have to wash it out to get all of the yainesech off, and you have to dry it up because whatever yainesech was there will be in the washing water. So you have to get that out too. But if the amount was a minimal amount, it needs to be diluted, let's say, but it doesn't need to be washed off and with the wash water totally removed. Um, okay. What yeah? happens if the, the non-Jew takes a rope and puts it around the cast that is splitting. That's a good question. It seems to me like in such a case, the rope is doing the work, not the non-Jew. Right. Uh, it sounds like now, but again, if he's the one tightening the rope or something like that, it would be the same thing. Um, but it's an interesting question because there it becomes a step removed. Right. I wonder if that's addressed by any of the Bishonim. It certainly seems like a good a good question to ask. Um, I like that question. Uh, okay, so we're at the next Mishnah on Samech Amudbeh. Obey kochavim shenimtza omeid v'tzad habor. Shell yain. A, a non Jew was standing next to the storage pit of the wine. Im milva ala vasur. If he has a debt that he can collect against this uh, Jewish owner, then the wine is prohibited. Okay? Ain lo milva ala, but if there is no debt owed to him, mutar, then it's permissible. Okay? We're going to see it's discussed in the Gemara a little bit, but basically the assumption is if he has a uh, debt, He'll be able, he thinks that this wine is collateral enough for him that he could touch it, he could take it, he could drink it, he could do whatever. Nafalabor, if someone fell into the pit, a non Jewish person fell into the storage pit, ve'ala, and got back out again. We're going to see this comes up again in the Gemara as well, a little bit morbid. Medado uh, 
or he measured it with a measuring rod. Or he removed a hornet from the wine with a long stick. Or he was wiping the foam off the top of a barrel that had a lot of foam. In all of those cases, it was a real case that was presented. So those, uh, what, four cases. And they said you should sell the wine. Rabbi Shimon Matir. And Rabbi Shimon said it's permissible, permissible seemingly even to drink the wine. A non-Jewish person picked up a barrel of wine and was very angry and threw the wine into the storage pit. That was a real case. And they permitted it, or he, he permitted it, maybe it's Rabbi Shimon. Okay. So the Gemara says, Amar Shmuel, V'hu sheish lo milva aloto yain. Shmuel says, not good enough that the, or it's not enough of a problem if the non-Jew has a debt against this Jewish owner, he has to use the wine itself as a collateral, okay? Because the assumption can't be the non-Jew is just going to come and, and do whatever he wants to your property, or maybe that was the assumption in Mishnah time. But by Shmuel's time, the sense was, no, 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 he'll only, there's only a risk of him handling the wine if he thinks that that wine is actually his collateral for this loan that he's going to come and, and mishandle it. Okay. Amaravashi. Matniti nami dika. The... Phrasing of the Mishnah is very precise. Ditanan, uh, to compare to this Mishnah, Hametaher Yeno Shelovit Kochavim, a person who wanted to purify the wine of an Ovit Kochavim. That means he wanted to produce kosher wine for a non Jewish owner. So, how does a Jewish person create, set up a circumstance to produce kosher wine for a non Jewish owner? The non Jewish owner, he, he, you, you write a deal, right? You sign a contract that says, I'm going to pay you this much money if you let me use your wine press and use your grapes and use your whatever, and then I'll come collect the wine when it's all fermented, right? So you kosher run in the, the A factory. kosher run in the factory, right? The Jew doesn't have the facilities. He doesn't have the fruit. He has the money. So he says, I'll pay you, but I have to bring in Jewish workers, okay? So that was the deal. So hametaher yeno shalavit kochavim v'notino birushuto, and he left it in his possession, and he writes, uh, the Nanju writes a star that says, I've already received the payment from you. This is even though he didn't actually yet receive the payment. Mutar. At that point, there is no longer a risk that the Nanju will uh, ha- mishandle the wine because he wrote a star that says he already received the money. That's enough. It's out of his mind enough that we're not worried he's going to come handle the wine. Aval im but if, even if after he wrote the Hikabalti, if the Jew wants to go get the wine, he doesn't allow him to until he actually pays the money. That was a case that happened in Beit Sha'an. They, they said the wine was prohibited. The reason why is because he wouldn't let the Jew go get the wine. So it's not like he was keeping it for himself. So he was willing to handle it. He thought of it as his. But if he would have allowed the Jew to take it, Shari, it would have been permissible. Shemamina, milva aloto yain ba'inan shemamina. That is, Rav Ashi used this Mishnah from uh, uh, further on, uh, the next Mishnah, uh, in order to prove, um, in order to prove uh, that Shmuel's read of our Mishnah is correct. So it's actually a very nice uh, idea that is a Mishnah from the same parak. The next Mishnah that like, gives enough information for us to be able to figure out maybe a detail of how one of the Amoraim said, oh, Shmuel just sort of said, oh, this Mishnah must be referring to such a case. And uh, Ravashi, much later, is able to say, oh, actually, you could infer it from the next Mishnah what kind of circumstances it was. Okay. Interesting. I wonder if at the time of Ravashi or Shmuel, the Mishnahs were split the way they are now. Uh, we don't know. Masef- I think of it generally the, whole, the, the like, sense we read the, the Mishnah as a full parak. Right. Um, but they still think in terms of Reisha and Seifa, mm. the, f- the first part of the parak, right? Even or within a certain clauses or how how it's associated, they have some sense of that. It's not saying, formalized uh, in the same way. So you, uh, your your some assumption about the Reisha here is clear, more clearly, um, more explicitly stated more in, the explicit in the Seifa, so. right? Right. And Shmuel may have been able to articulate that to you. Implicitly, mm. but but Rabashi sort of was able to make it an explicit Connected statement as well, right? Shmuel sort of just had Shmuel knew the Mishnayot, and he said like, "Oh, obviously, it must be talking about a case 
that he had the debt, that the collateral for the loan was this wine specifically. Mm-hmm. Uh, and then Ravashi comes actually use the next mission to explain, well, why is it that Shmuel explained it that way? It's because there's all of this, all mm-hmm. of this material. Okay. Um, bor so what about the case of he fell into the wine pit and then he got out again? So Amara Papa, Rav Papa said, Loshanu ela may. It only is permissible <clears throat> if he uh, fell in and drowned in the wine and and was removed dead. It's very interesting grammatically. The Allah, I would think, means he got out, not he was taken out. It could have been Eluhu. That he resurfaced. Well, something like that. But anyway, <laughs> Aval, Allah, Chai, if he emerged alive, Asur, then it's prohibited. So my time, well, what's the reasoning? Amar of Papa, did dami alei ki yom edam. Because in a cir- circumstance where you your life was in danger, you were going to drown in this uh, barrel of wine, and then you emerged safely. So immediately, the non-Jewish person is going to have intense gratitude for having been saved from this uh, dangerous situation, and he'll want to pour out a libation to his idol or whatever. Um, and certainly, it's like yom edam uh, in that it's a day that he considers a celebratory day for his holiday. We, we wouldn't be allowed to to do business with him as well. Um, okay. So the machloket in the Mishnah was that the Chachamim, or the anonymous Mishnah, seems to say that these are prohibited for a Jewish person to drink, but you could sell them. And Rabbi Shimon says uh, it's permissible, seemingly, even to drink. So Amar Rab Ada Bar Ahava said, Rabbi Shimon Brachot al Rosho. There should be many Brachot on Rabbi Shimon's head. If he says it's allowed, then it's really allowed, even to drink it. And when he says it's prohibited, he says it's prohibited even to derive benefit from. That is, he's unambiguous. He has only two categories. It's mutter to drink, it's mutter to sell it, or it's asr to drink and it's asr to sell it. But he doesn't have this intermediate category of uh, mutter to sell and asr to drink. Okay, so Rav Adabar Ahava likes that about Rabbi Shimon. That is, he takes his position to the fullest extent. He takes it seriously. He doesn't have a gray zone or an intermediate category. Okay? Um, There's a note here. Yeah. From Rashash that says uh, that blessing would only be appropriate if Rabbi Shimon was still alive. So he suggests there were two... Uh, two uh, Rav Adabar yeah, Right. I don't know about that. Okay. Uh, it's an interesting suggestion from the Roshash, but I'm not sure. <laughs> yeah, uh, cool. Rav Adabar we know, is is one of the Amoraim, and fine. So he could, I mean, but they, we also believe in Olam Haba. Why can't he have Brachot al Roshob al Olam Haba, right? Uh, I'm not sure. I have to it's see the Roshash. I'll look into the Roshash. Tosifo Sintani says, there, there, were, there, there were two scholars. But Tosfot always says there are two people, right? Tosfot also I says that Rabbi Yeshua Ben Karf are two different people, uh-huh. right? Um, sometimes, I mean, sometimes to make certain Gemaras make sense, uh-huh. we have different traditions about what someone said. Uh-huh. So if they contradict, then you have to say either one of the traditions is wrong or there are two different people. Uh-huh. Um, um, uh-huh. Um, I have to tell my joke about the Rishash now. So the story goes, this is a real story, as far as I know, but I, it, it's a funny story, um, which is that supposedly Rav Shlomo Zaman Arbach um, was teaching a Gemara Shir in his yeshiva, and at some point someone mentioned him or brought up during the Shir, oh, you know, I heard the only reason the Rishash's commentary is printed in the back of the Vilna Shas is because the Rishash's father-in-law was very wealthy and paid a lot of money for them to print the Rishash in the, in, in the Gemara, because he was roughly contemporaneous with the Ram family printing house. And Rosh Hashanah Arbach shoots back and says, I also would have spent a lot of money to have the Rosh Hashanah printed in the Vilna Shah. Um, Rosh Hashanah very, has very insightful and very original comments very often, and it certainly is always a good good achron to take a look at. Um, I like the Rosh Hashanah a lot. Okay, Amar Rebichia Breder ad Abba Bar Nachmeni. So Rebichia, the son of Abba Bar Nachmeni, said, Amar Rav Chizda, Amar Rav, quoting from Rav Chizda, quoting Rav, but Amar Rav Amar Chizda, Amar Ziiri Halachik Rav so there, all of these different Amoraim say they think halacha is like Rabbi Shimon's opinion. Or the third version of, of exactly how this tradition was passed on. However, the Gemara concludes vein halacha Rabbi Shimon. In fact, the final conclusion will not be like Rabbi Shimon. That is, other Amoraim wanted to consider that case, and specifically, we're talking about uh, those those four cases. 
uh, where um, where the right the uh, he touched it with only with a measuring pole. He was getting the fly out of the wine or whatever. He didn't he didn't touch the wine. He didn't really move or stir the wine anyway, right? He was either measuring the depth of the wine, how much wine is there. He was taking a hornet out, or he fell in by accident uh, and died. Um, or he wiped the foam off the top of the barrel, but didn't actually touch the wine itself. So in all of those cases, Rabbi Shimon says it's perfectly permissible, and the uh, Rabbanan say that it's still prohibited because of Yanesef, uh, but you could sell it, so it's not a Surbahana. Uh, and all of these other Amoraim wanted to say, oh, the halacha should be like Rabbi Shimon, and still we say no. Generally, uh, it's a rare case where we say the halacha follows Rabbi Shimon's opinion. Um, I mean, certain cases, certainly, and against certain other Tanaim, but generally, like if he's in a debate with Rabbi Yehuda, usually the halacha follows Rabbi Yehuda, not always. Um, uh, yes, Charlie. Uh, Stein says, so it's not, there's my cloak at uh, Rambam and Ryman, where uh, Ryman actually hopes like Rabbi Shimon. Because probably he has some other version of the Gemara, or he reads it differently, or he has some other sugya. I have to see inside and take a look at the right. Where, which parak? Uh, Sefer Kedusha. Yeah. In Mahalara, he wrote which parak? Uh, parak 12. Okay, so I'll take a look after this year. That's a good thing to know. Um, okay. Uh, the next piece is about the throwing. Okay? So, right, the last case in the Mishnah had been, right, if he threw the wine barrel into the wine storage pit, uh, and he was angry, right? He threw it while he was angry. Okay? So the Gemara says, They said it was permissible. Ravashi said, an idea which we already saw earlier a little bit. So whatever kind of contact would be considered to transfer the impurity for someone who is a Zav, uh, then if a non-Jewish person does that to wine, then just like if a Zav will make it Tame to transfer the impurity, if a non-Jewish person does it to the wine, it makes it Yainessa. What's interesting about this, we see many places where Avodah Zarah and also Ovde Avodah Zarah are associated with a certain level of Tuma. Already in the time of the Tanaim, the Mishnah and Shabbat discusses the fact that Avodah Zarah itself, idols, are Tame Kesheretz. They're considered to be like like a dead dead lizards and things like that. Very and well, so that's for a different <laughs> reason and at a different degree, not like a sheretz. Um, they're only metameh Um But so that's one in, instance. The rabbis also instituted that even though uh, from Torah law, non-Jewish people do not, uh, be, while they are alive at least, do not become impure, cannot transmit impurity. The rabbis decreed that all non-Jewish people be treated at the level of impurity of a Zav or a Zava. Um, so here too, the comparison between a Zav and an Oved Kochavim is actually very comparable in a certain degree, which is that the level of impurity which this non-Jewish person, we assume, will transmit to the wine anyway, well, he's also going to make it uh, not just impure, but also prohibited to derive any benefit from. Okay. So, and if it would remain pure while a Zav did it, then it should not make Yainasach. So, what was the case? The case was someone threw a barrel of wine. He was very angry. He picked up a barrel of wine and threw it into the pit of wine. So, wait a second. If a Zav did that, would it be Tahor Tame? Tahor. Why? That's what I didn't know why. Because <laughs> it, it doesn't, you don't spread to, uh, tumor by, uh, by throwing. By throwing, right. If he touched it, it's one thing. But if he throws something into something else, okay, so let's see. So, eat today, Rav Huna Ravashi. Rav Huna challenged Ravashi's position. So, Rav Huna challenged Ravashi's statement by, by quoting our Mishnah and said, Our Mishnah seems like a proof against you because our case is a case of throwing something. And it said, shiro. So we can infer from the Mishnah, Bechamato in. The only reason it's permissible is because he was angry, is why he threw it. That is, uh, he did it without any kavana. However, Shiloh Bechamato, if he did it while he was not angry, when he was calm and his intent was to throw the wine into the pit, lo, it would be prohibited. So, hata, so that is, how can Ravashi defend his general principle? It sounds like our Mishnah contradicts it. So what do we have to do? We have to reinterpret the word zarka labor, threw it into the pit. And how do we interpret it instead? Hatav de ka'azil mine mine. It was actually not uh, throwing. It was something more along the lines of rolling. But Rashi says de ka'azil mine mine. Shehalechu mit galgel hakli kol sha'a al yedei shehu megalgelo umorido labor. It's like rolling it into the pit. 
Hilchach shelo bechamatolo dechai shinan dil managa. We're concerned that when he finally lowered it into the pit, when it rolled to the edge and rolled in, that he actually touched the wine that was in the pit. But uh, the kind of contact he would have had from throwing is not problematic enough to cause to cause that level of problem, because just like Azab wouldn't have been a problem, so too for an Ovei Kohabim would not be a problem either, even though he, now, what happened? It happened, they're describing a case that actually happened, right? What did the Mishnah actually say? The Mishnah actually says, Right, Natal Tachavit Vizarka Bechamato Labor. He picked it up and threw it because he was angry. Right, Zehayam Ase Vehechshiro. It was the case. So Rav Huna and Ravashi inferring, right? Really, Rav Huna inferring from the Mishnah. Oh, the only reason the Mishnah has to teach me the word Bechamato that he was angry, I can implicitly understand from our Mishnah that had he not been angry, they would not have allowed it. That's not necessarily true at all. It's not a very sharp read of the Mishnah. Um, it's taking a lot of what, what the Amoraim very often do with Mishnayot is, is a hyper-literalism it, or, or hype, uh, omnisignificance. Every little word in the Mishnah is of legal significance. So it's not just describing the case, oh, it was an angry guy. The fact that he was angry when he threw the barrel must mean his level of intent uh, was important for the determination of whether or not the wine would be kosher in that circumstance. So it's actually fascinating to see uh, that they take this omnisignificant read of the Mishnah, uh, infer a halacha, which seemingly contradicts the conclusion of the Mishnah, in order to either challenge or in challenge Ravashi's general rule. And then what does Ravashi do? Ravashi has to even further stretch the Mishnah to fit his rule. Um, right? He reinterprets, oh, he didn't throw it into the pit, he really rolled it. Right? So it's fascinating to see how much later, you know, generations later, the Moraim working with Mishnayot that already existed had to work to either because they had created sort of more general rules or because they had uh, different traditions or because, you know, they wanted to read the Mishnah with that level of omnisignificance uh, that, that it would go to that extent. So we'll start tomorrow, Shabbat. Uh, we'll start with the next Mishnah on the top of Samech Aleph Hope everyone has a wonderful Shabbat. Shabbat Rosh Chodesh, Shabbat HaChodesh. Uh, three Sifrei Torah. Uh, there's a minhag in some communities to have just as many kugels as you have <laughs> Sifrei Torah. So it's a three three kugel Shabbat. I hope everyone enjoys. Uh, nice long davening, halal, musaf, etc.